morning, everyone. Greetings to one and all. We hope that you and your family are safe and healthy. Can you hear me, everyone? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, good morning. And uh, uh, greetings to one and all. We hope that you and your families are safe and healthy. It gives us immense warmth and great pleasure to grace all of you present in the interest of entire renewable energy sector. Before we begin this webinar, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you who sincerely committed to this webinar to make it a success. This event would have been impossible without the support of each and everyone present here. Before we go further, I would want to review the functionality of GoToWebinar. Your our active participant is important throughout the session. Right now, I have everyone on mute to avoid background noises that may distract you from listening to the webinar. Throughout the webinar, someone from our staff will be managing the chat functionally. You can enter your questions and comment in the question box throughout the presentation, which will be taken up at the end of the webinar. We are also streaming the webinar live on YouTube. For YouTube viewers, please enter your questions in the chat box. Our team will populate them and they will be taken up at the end of the webinar. It gives us tremendous contentment to introduce the most esteemed personalities who have won accolades in their respective fields. Now, we would like to move uh, to Mr. Arpo Mukherjee, Senior Program Associate, I4S, is supporting the Energy and Climate Change Initiative of I4S. His work focuses on addressing the challenges of the clean energy sector through direct engagement with international, national, and state level stakeholders. He is a mechanical engineer with a master degree in power management from the University of Petroleum and Energy Study. Over to you, sir. Hi, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone, uh, to the, all the attendees who are participating from different parts of the world. I welcome you all to this uh, webinar uh, and I am grateful that uh, REM has found me as a uh, uh, expert in the sector of renewable energy and climate change and I would like to present you my findings on this sector and share my experience on this. I'm sharing my screen. Hopefully, I'm hopeful that my is my screen is visible to all of you. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, it is visible. Yeah. So today we are talking about renewable energy mix in India's energy demand, and I will take you to the different horizons if you are talking about uh, demand of renewable energy so what are the different factors we should think uh, while uh, talking about renewable energy okay Uh, so, uh, yeah. renewable energy, majorly, if you want to talk about majorly about renewable energy, there are four factors, uh, affordability, availability, sustainability, and reliability, which determines that there is a demand of renewable energy or not, or there is a demand of any kind of energy there is, no, um, is there or not. And affordability directly uh, is defined through economy, where we talk about the cost of the network, the fuel cost, the electricity bills, and the levelized cost of electricity. Whereas if you talk about the availability of electricity, it will come through disruptions that may be internal or external. Uh, I will come to each of this point, uh, especially in my slides. Just to give you a brief background, I am telling you that if you want to frame the demand of renewable energy, you have to frame it in these four different uh, factors. So 
one will be economy uh, second if uh, uh, availability is there it is about the long term sustainability uh, you have to talk about carbon emissions you have to talk about water consumption and in the, in the re reliability part you have to talk about the system capacity how much shock it can take what is its uh, rated capacity and is the system adequate or not so i am starting with the aff uh, affordability part the affordability of the electricity you see this is the rate of power uh, in each of the state and you see the states like maharashtra madhya pradesh mumbai west bengal these are paying uh, the maximum electricity uh, per household whereas states like daman and diu dadra nagar haveli goa pondicherry these states are paying less in comparison to the other states and uh, a lot of solar installation has been happened in the state of maharashtra state of madhya pradesh uh, but there is no installation happened in west bengal and if you see in the top 26 list gujarat is not there uh, and uh, gujarat has the maximum uh, amount of uh, installation so when we are talking of uh, affordability of the people and uh, the installation uh, uh, is it proportion that if uh, the cost of electricity is maximum in that area then people will go for solar uh, is it uh, proportional or not uh, in my next slide this is like uh, status like 7 8 days before where uh, mnri has shared the rooftop solar uh, progress status of different states and you see gujarat has installed 1000 megawatt of solar pv uh, on the rooftops Uh, majorly on the residential part and the second state after gujarat is rajasthan rajasthan has installed only 35 megawatt which is 3% of gujarat that is the second running state if you add all the state it will be not become 10% of gujarat so you see only one state has installed so much electricity so much rooftop solar plant but uh, the tariffs are not high there so it gives us to wonder then what what are the different aspects people are looking towards when they are adopting renewable energy how renewable energy is playing a mix in the in, in the sector is this factor of affordability of uh, current electricity uh, is it's clear that the factor of electricity uh, your current electricity prices is not enough to de de determine uh, you should adopt uh, solar pv or not so uh, but if you are talking of affordability in 2010 uh, the big solar parks the cost of a unit from big solar park was uh, 17 rupees 18 rupees 12 rupees in 2010 but currently uh, in uh, 2018 we have seen a very low of 1.99 uh, if you can see my house point but after that there has been gradual increase in uh, solar uh, cost of uh, solar pv through tenders uh, it is because uh, different condition came inside people some um, project uh, some tenders said that you have to do hybrid solar wind some uh, told that you have to install battery to give it more uh, strength reliability so now uh, 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 even uh, the last tender which was in october ireda pan india psu tranche 3 of 5000 megawatt the tender was uh, uh, the cost of power was uh, 3 rupees and 1 paisa but it is an rtc rtc means uh, you can ask for any amount of power at any time and you will get at 3 rupees 1 paisa so which is much cheaper than the electricity you, you are getting in states in states you are paying 9 rupees 8 rupees even in delhi you are paying 5 rupees uh, you can compare to the lowest uh, uh, of himachal pradesh or jammu kashmir or sikkim the cost of power from these solar parks are cheaper than that but still we are paying such high for grid electricity so uh, it means that solar power is more affordable than all uh, than all uh, the residents uh, across india but still it is not making up in different states 
So as per our uh, analysis in 2014, uh, this was the scenario in 2014 where rooftop solar power uh, power was a bit higher than the cost of a unit. But now the cost of unit has gone very low and it is affordable for everyone. So here I have discussed about affordability. Now I am talking about the availability. How the power is available across India and is that a factor de determining that there is increase in uh, renewable energy in uh, our energy mix because of the factor of availability? So now uh, I am talking of a different uh, source altogether that is coal. Okay. So map number one talks about uh, uh, the state which has coal plants uh, installed and state uh, uh, state uh, map one says state which has different thermal power plants across the India and map two discusses about uh, different uh, uh, coal uh, mines. So you see coals from uh, these mines goes to other states, mines in Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh goes to states like Gujarat, Maharashtra or Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh and uh, there the power is generated. But is the power is consumed in this state. Let's see the sector of automobiles. So you see here, uh, this uh, map uh, describes the coal districts, which are the coal districts across India, like in Jharkhand, in Chhattisgarh, in Odisha and Madhya Pradesh. And then there are districts which are having thermal power station, which are not in the same district, but nearby district or very far districts. But their power is going to automobiles, uh, industry which are not located in those districts at all, which are located in nearby some big city or something like that. So you see power, uh, the source of fuel is not related to uh, the uh, coal mines or the thermal power districts. So we are transporting coal from this place to some place in uh, Gujarat or Maharashtra. From there, the coal has been converted into uh, electricity and it is going to uh, some other uh, uh, places where automobile is manufactured. So this causes a huge uh, uh, transmission and distribution network losses and due to which we have to pay uh, more to uh, the discoms or the transmission or billing charges. But if you talk about uh, solar energy, solar energy across India is a very good potential. We have more than 300 days of electricity and our, we can generate uh, from 1300 units to uh, 1600 units uh, uh, for one, from one kilowatt of solar PV installed in any part of the country, except some parts in the Northeast. So you see each of the states has a lot of potential and the solar power av available across India. So it should be like that, that all the states should have uh, increased their solar power uh, footprint. But is it so? The question is, the answer is no. Even though the solar power is available, even uh, the states have uh, different power consumption pattern, uh, increased power consumption cap uh, pattern, but the availability of solar uh, is also not a factor of determining that renewable energy footprint is increasing in the state or not. Why? This is a very good question. Now, uh, I'm not talking about sustainability because I know there will be many experts in this uh, state, but when we talk about solar PV or any other renewable energy and compare with the thermal, then we talk about carbon emissions and we talk of water in intensity. So carbon emissions is one thing which will be uh, dealt by many speakers. But let me tell you about what water intensity. I am studying right now different water consumption of different thermal power plants across India and I'm finding for per unit of electricity, any ultra uh, super critical power plant consumes 14 to 16 liters of water. So for one unit of electricity, we burn like uh, a half kg to 700 grams of coal and we use uh, 7 to uh, 20 liters of water to generate electricity from that unit. So the water consumption is also going to be a big factor if you want to continue with the thermal power plants. Now let's talk about the reliability. The reliability, what does reliability means? That if uh, I want power in my household at that time, at that point, is it available or not? 
uh, will the renewable energy integration in my industry or household will give me more resilience uh, will give me uh, more adequate type of system so that i can plan my production or working hours better so uh, this is a study which was done in 2020 by uh, cw which says about uh, availability of electricity in different urban and local household across the country so you see uh, there are uh, states like i am just taking the rightmost and the leftmost example gujarat has a uh, rural area has 23 hours of reliable electricity across the state whereas urban area has 24 hours of electricity now i compare it to jharkhand jharkhand 19 hours of reliable electricity average full year whereas rural area have 16 hours of electricity this is average across the state it may be different from one district to other district okay so averagely each rural uh, household is not getting eight of electricity in day but so i thought of starting study this place and i found that there are districts uh, or uh, villages which have when i went there there were villages which does not have electricity for more than 5 to 7 days and which kept me shocking how these districts or these villages or areas are working there because electricity is not there for 7 days 8 days 10 days and but there are a lot of coal mines uh, nearby them from there they are generating uh, producing coals the coals are getting transported to thermal power plants thermal power plants are generating electricity and it is getting distributed but the places which are near the thermal power plants are not having the electricity why so uh, the question was how the people are working there how the people is then i found that that the people nearby this place they have adopted to the renewable energy uh, renewable energy and they are using it for each and every livelihood aspect so this is a picture in which uh, this woman village woman is using this to process dal and atta for the village consumption and nearby villages comes uh, to her uh, to process their uh, flours dals and other things and uh, uh, there is uh, solar pumping devices installed here which was previously connected with the diesel generator uh, genset but now they have installed uh connected it with solar pv this ata chakki man who earns only 2000 rupees per month but he spends more than 3 and 1500 rupees in his electricity from the solar pv but he is finding solar pv more reliable uh than uh grid electricity and then there are oil mills which are running entirely on solar pv and there are many small enterprises which has come upon in the state uh, which does not have electricity which are running fully on solar so uh, just to give you a uh, uh, thought of what i am what i was trying to conclude through all this uh, uh, my presentation was that the factors which we study like availability cost economics uh, availability uh, adequacy of the system technology these factors play a very partial role in development of renewable energy into electricity main main and major factor which plays the role is the policy the policy which is at the state uh, level so uh, the state level of uh, state of gujarat has a very good policy and uh, the policy makers are working very good in the area due to which uh, it has such a high footprint of rooftop solar plants but Uh, other states are not able to match with that so if there are good policy makers good policy implementers in the state that will increase the renewable energy mix in the this thing so uh, this is a perspective design of uh, how india is going to transform to a net zero economy from uh, 2020 to 2050 it is last year study in terry and it has found out that all the coal which will get replaced and solar uh, renewable energy will play a big role in providing electricity uh, to uh, commercial residential and the industrial consumer well as the thermal uh, will go down and so uh, by this i will try to end my presentation and for any questions we'll take it later thank you
Thank you for your informative session, sir. This will definitely be a valuable insight for our participants. Okay, now we will move for for uh, further to our number next speaker, Mr. Gajanan Patel, Managing Director, Urja Bio System Private Limited. He completed his bachelor from Chemical Engineering and MS in Clean Technology from University of Newcastle, United Kingdom. With marriage, he started independent entrepreneurship in 2006. Worked on waste to energy projects. In last 15 years, he has installed around 200 projects on waste to power generation. He has also installed more than 15,000 family sites, biogas plants across Maharashtra, and six projects on bio uh, biogas bottling. Over. Over to you, sir. Please. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Please continue. Uh, actually, Mr. Gajanan Patil uh, is not available right now. So, uh, myself, Arthi Gajre, I am going to present this webinar, sir. Okay. Please continue, ma'am. Yes. Uh, okay. Can you see in my screen now? Yes, ma'am. It's visible. Okay. Okay. Uh, actually, myself, Parthi Kajre, and uh, I have completed my uh, M Tech environment. And in the last ten years, I have been a uh, operation and maintenance of this uh, biogas project, uh, working with this one. Okay. So uh, we will move uh, to our uh, towards our present. Okay. Uh, okay. You can see this complete uh, PPT, sir. Presentation. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's we move. Okay. Now we are going to see means uh, whatever the means whatever biogas technology is there. Okay. Uh, it is uh, important to uh, meet the energy demand right now. Okay. So this is the short uh, introduction for Urja Bio System Private Limited. Actually, we have installed uh, 200 uh, biogas plants uh, for power generation across the India, and we have uh, right now 15 years of experience in this field. And there are some uh, small plants are there. Two uh, MQ and four MQ gas generation plants are available, uh, which have we have installed that 10,000 uh, more family size plants we have installed in Maharashtra also. So community based, there are 10 projects. And uh, four CBG projects are there. That uh, CBG with compressed biogas projects are there. And uh, we are also involved with the various bodies like Indo MNRI, uh, participating in SBM, that is uh, Swachh Bharat Mission Grami, and uh, Gobardhan Stream Limited, uh, like that. Actually, Urja is actually working uh, for the Sasat scheme also, providing complete end-to-end -end solutions uh, under one of them. Uh, moving for the next slide. Now we are going to see the current energy scenario in India. What is the current energy scenario for the India? Now, if you see the global energy consumption uh, will increase by 30 percent with an annual growth of 1.6 percent up to 2030. So, the India is the world's third largest energy consumption country, and uh, thanks to for uh, this because uh, rising of our income and our improving stand standards of living so energy use has doubled since 2000 with 80% and uh, now uh, 80% use of this one so yeah among the renewable energy sources uh, if you find the biomass uh, biomass is found to be the most effective uh, it having the uh, potential like electricity generation from biomass is near about 312 Terawatt hours, where uh, we can utilize only this much. So, for due to electricity requirement uh, increasing day by day, self sufficient uh, sufficiency in terms of energy and uh, power that electricity for village will play important role in uh, here. So here, now uh, first of all, I will explain uh, how biogas plant works. Uh, if you see uh, first one, means this is the simple flow diagram for biogas plant. Actually, uh, biogas is the traditional one. Okay, so in that uh, one, uh, if you see here, mixing tank is there. 
so there are different feedstocks uh, for a biogas generation means uh, we can say different biomass are there you can say that cow dung is there poultry litter is there uh, fresh mud is there napier grass is there means there are different biomass are uh, biomass are available in huge amount in india uh, to convert this into biogas and biogas to electricity or you can go for cbg also so whatever the feedstock is there that first of all we are going to mix in this tank then it is sent to the biogas digester uh, this is the biogas digester in which the reactions are going on and we will get the biogas in the ms dome that is that dome is nothing but uh, one of the biogas storage uh, the, that is uh, made uh, in ms and from that we are going to collect this in raw gas balloon actually this uh, biogas uh, generation is uh, 24 hours process so there is a need for this particular uh, biogas storage we need some uh, this uh, balloons raw gas balloon is there and clean gas balloon is there this biogas is nothing but our uh, methane gas means ch4 percentage in that is 75 percent is there and that we are going to uh, send to the scrubbing system through biogas blower and then you will get as the clean gas the h2s uh, uh, in ppm it is present in biogas so first of all we are removing that h2s in this biogas uh, scrubbing system and then we we are passing with biogas generator now this biogas generator uh, convert this uh, this into electricity and we can use uh, whatever you need like that so uh, this is the simple means flow diagram for the biogas uh, uh, concept is there actually whatever the biomass is there Uh, that having some uh, retention time to convert that particular biomass into uh, biogas so that may be uh, 35 days 40 days or maybe 50 days so uh, from this digester one part is over that is biogas we will get here second part is nothing but that digested slurry is there so whatever the digested slurry you will get from the uh, biogas digester that we are going to collect in the uh, slurry outlet chamber then this is a digested slurry we are going to pass to the solid liquid separator from that we will get uh, some solid parts and uh, liquid part also actually this is the uh, organic liquid part that uh, whatever the liquid you will get that is organic uh, liquid fertilizer is there that you can use directly uh, to our uh, farms and whatever the solid uh, you will get uh, in that we are going to add uh, we have done some uh, explain that is we have generated from that is phosphate rich organic manure we have generated here and uh, that we, uh, that is in granular form and that we can sold for the as a organic fertilizer also so this is a simple uh, biogas concept minimum one sec we uh, we will move for the next Slide. Now, uh, this is uh, whatever I have discussed in previous slide. That is, biogas is nothing but that is CH four CO two uh, trace gases are and some trace gases are there. Uh, that is S two S and uh, water vapor like that. One. now whatever the uh, biogas you will get there are the different uh, utilization options for this biogas that uh, we can go for the heating or cooking application or for electricity generation or convert this into cng that is compressed biogas cbg you can say that cbg also uh, for this one here i have shown the pictures for this one now we will see the uh, biogas potential in uh, different uh we can say different biomass of different substrate uh, means if we are considering as a poultry litter when you uh, take poultry litter as a one ton from that you will get near about 100 mq uh, gas per ton if you uh, take as a napier grass you will get as 120 if you take uh, sugar industry press mud that is 130 mq uh, per ton is there from distillery fluent you will get as the 50 mq uh, per ton for cattle dung it is 45 mq uh, per ton and for mixed food waste means that uh, M msw waste we can say that municipal uh, wet waste or biodegradable waste is there that is having the biogas potential like uh, from one ton you will get near about 65 uh, cubic meter gas uh, per ton so this is the potential for different biomass 
now uh, let's move towards dairy industry means uh, as per uh, 2019 census india is having near about 192 million cows and uh, 109 million buffalo so if you consider the total cow dung available that is 4.5 million ton per day cow dung availability is there in india so biogas generation from that you will get as 203 million mq per day so from this uh, electricity generation actually one mq uh, yeah, biogas uh, will gives 1.5 units uh, electricity so according to that the electricity generation here is uh, 304 million units per day if you go for uh, per annum that is uh, 1 lakh 6400 million units per annum you will get as a electricity here so this much potential energy potential is there in only cow dung also so likewise likewise there are the different biomass are, uh, biomass available in india so there is lots of potential for this uh, particular energy uh, sector to uh, meet our uh, energy uh, requirement whatever the energy requirement is there so uh, if uh, from this whatever the cow dung is there after biogas whatever the organic fertilizer you will get that is nothing but 300 million tons per annum you will get as the uh, organic fertilizer now uh, what happened in uh, dairy industry due to the low cost of milk and uh, high cost of fodder uh, the keeping animals become expensive for dairy so uh, we are trying to support them by converting dung into the energy and uh, value added fertilizers uh, through waste to waste projects now as due to the electricity requirement increasing day by day the self sufficiency in terms of energy and electricity for village will play important role here for go shalas and uh, like that one so this is the energy and from that from is nothing but phosphate rich organic manure whatever the digested slurry we will get that we are going to convert into prom that is granular prom now if you consider one cow and which gives on an average 15 kg per day as a dump from that uh, if you put a biogas plant uh, then uh, if you will see that you will get at 6 cylinders or 250 minutes per year 6 cylinder lpg gas replacement is there Uh, that much biogas uh, generation is here and uh, we are going to use for this cooking purpose and from that you will get as whatever the manure uh, digested slurry you will get that solid part that we are going to mix in a uh, rock phosphate and from that we are going to generate this uh, granular uh, granular prom so this uh, from one cow if you consider as a one cow we will get as 1.5 ton prom per year now for this uh, uh, this is the potential uh, from one cow now here is a one case study for uh, sada dairy raipur we have installed uh, one plant um, they are having uh, near about 2 2500 cattle from that they daily generate uh, 30 tons per day cow dung generation is there so project cost for this uh, 2 cr and biogas generation is near about 1200 cubic meter that is per day is there and electricity generation is 150 kilowatt now whatever the digested uh, slurry they get they are, they are converting this into the prom and they will get near about 9000 kg per day as a prom and liquid manure as a 50000 liter per day so they have uh, get the subsidies from creda and mnri also so this is the one of uh, our case study at uh, sada dairy raipur chatisgarh now this is a simple uh, project view uh, photographs that is a uh, cattle shed is there this is one is the digester from digester uh, whatever the gas is there that we are going to uh, send to the scrubbing tank uh, for storage uh, we are providing uh, this uh, this type of uh, balloon and uh, for that balloon room is there and whatever the gas is there that we are going to send to the engine to generate the electricity now this is what more uh, uh, project this is the one more project that is a uh, central of excellence of dairy baramati we have just installed the plant capacity is 10 ton per day and uh, here the biogas generation is 400 uh, cubic meters per day electricity generation near uh, near about 500 units per day 
here we are using all the scrubbing system for biogas is having the capacity 50 cubic meter per hour, hour and the engines we have given that 40 kilowatt uh, two engines we have installed there the biogas storage capacity is 300 cubic meter uh, that is balloon capacity is 300 cubic meter we have uh, installed there uh, whatever uh, from this plant uh, you will get as the from production per day that is 2.5 tons per day and liquid manual generation is 10,000 liters per day. This is uh, one more uh, Bhagya Lakshmi project at Manchan. Means uh, whatever uh, this, this particular project means uh, Bhagya Lakshmi is there or this uh, dairy is there. They are self-sufficient uh, for this uh, electricity. Means uh, for their uh, small uh, uh, small plants they use this electricity and they are uh, fulfill for this uh, the requirement of electricity by using this this uh, this electricity from biogas. So this is the one of uh, Bhagya Lakshmi project at Manchar, which is having uh, 60 ton per day uh, capacity. 60 ton cow dung uh, they are feeding uh, each day, and from that uh, they have there is a biogas generation that is 2,400 cubic meter per day is there. And electricity generation is 300 units per day. So, like this, uh, there are the many uh, projects we have installed in uh, across the India, uh, depending upon dairy. Now, next we will move uh, the biomass that is poultry waste, or you can say as a poultry litter. Now, here we will see the scenario of uh, poultry. The poultry is the one of the fastest growing segment in India, and uh, near about 729 million birds in India generating near about 23.54 million metric ton poultry manure per year. So if you calculate the biogas generation, then you will get as 2,300 million m cube per day. Biogas generation we can uh, we, uh, is there or electricity generation, we can go for that one, 3,500 million units per day. Means this much huge potential is there and huge uh, scope is there for converting the biomass into electricity and fulfilling our uh, electricity requirement. So if you see the uh, hatcheries also, there are 9,486 metric tons hatchery waste is there per year. And uh, from slaughterhouse, you will get as 1.15 million metric tons slaughterhouse waste per year. As you, uh, if you see the energy potential, means uh, if you consider as a one bird, uh, which generates near about 100 to 120 gram per liter per day. So one ton uh, fresh liter generates 100 cubic meter biogas. And one cubic meter biogas, uh, which generates 1.5 unit power. So if you consider this as a CBG, means uh, converting this into CBG, then one cubic meter biogas is equal, equivalent to near about 400 grams CBG. One bird uh, generates around 250 million uh, milliliter liquid uh, manure and 30 gram of solid manure per day. So this is the uh, poultry waste, uh, means energy, serum, energy potential is there from poultry waste. Now, what is the role of the Urja at the uh, poultry waste management? First of all, uh, poultry means poultry litter is the challenging because uh, it is uh, heavier. It has it consists it have a heavier silica and lighter feather content. So these these yeah, so it's difficult to deal with the waste having such content. But uh, Urja biosystem has focused and uh, succeeds to remove those. To extremely opposite nature impurities by providing suitable inbuilt design. So, this is the biogas plant at Nashik where I installed this. I mean, 20. So, so which is half per day, poultry turbine. So, here the biogas generation is 2500 cubic meter uh, scrub, per hour scrubbing system and uh, 200 kilowatt biogas engines are there. So uh, the liquid manual generated here is 50,000 liter. Uh, and they are uh, uh, requirements. They are uh, getting the better revenue from these, all these things. And 
whatever the power is there that uh, they are, it says they are using in their uh, poultry so this is the project overview for uh, this then you will get a 35 lakh ton per year pressmud available with us and if you see the uh, pressmud potential biogas potential from uh, one ton pressmud we will get here about uh, 1000 uh, 100 mq per uh, 100 mq per ton we will get as a biogas so here one case study i have uh, i want to share with you that is, uh, if we consider as a 100 ton press mud uh, biogas plant, from that you will get as the biogas that is uh, 13,000 13, cubic meter uh, and CH4 methane content for 55% if you consider that is 5,500 and CBG you will get as 5,000 kg per day and the manual generator if you go for the prong generation you will get 25 ton per day prong. So, the uh, rate of this uh, CBG means whatever the CBG generated and press money, we will get as a CBG uh, that we can store as a rupees 46 per kg by using the uh, this BPCL and ion fuel, uh, the help of this BPCL and ion fuel company. Now, rate of manure, what are the manure generated? That uh, manure we can store uh, for rupees 2 per kg. And if you go for the man uh, from generation, that we, we, we can store rupees 4 kg, uh, rupees 4 per kg. So, revenue uh, for this plant per year, we can get as 9.5 CR per year. So, this is the one of case study for the pressure based biogas plant. Now, next is uh, that is Napier grass. Now, this uh, we can say Napier grass energy crop as a Napier grass to generate uh, for the power plant. You can go for uh, from Napier grass, you can go for the energy generation also. Now, and from Napier grass. Uh, purchase cost is rupees thousand per ton. In, uh, one farmer uh, giving one acre land for cultivation, we will get uh, we get rupees one lakh per annum. Now, if you uh, consider the uh, nuclear grass energy potential, means here I have considered the case study for 10 ton nuclear grass with uh, biogas plant for electricity generation. Now, if you uh, 10 ton uh, nuclear grass, we are going to uh, we are having 10 ton nuclear grass per day, then there will be the biogas generation near about uh, 1200 cubic meter per day. From that, you can go for uh, electricity generation will get as 1500 units per day. And uh, organic manure will get as a 20,000 liter per day. Now, if you see the saving earning due to the electricity uh, generation and manual save, the saving due to electricity generation here, uh, we are getting 1,500 units per day. So, if now the rate for this particular electricity, uh, uh, that is 7.5, that is per unit is there, and uh, from that you will get better revenue. So, uh, from sale of liquid organic manure also you will get the revenue. The total revenue generated for this 10 ton naked black bread biogas plant is here about 60 lakh per annum. So let's move. What is that prop? This bio prop that is available and sustainable and substitute for this uh, chemical fertilizer system. This prom is nothing but our phosphorus organic manure. From is produced by biodigested from biogas plants with rock phosphate. Means whatever digested slurry uh, we have uh, after solid liquid separation, that, uh, solid in solid part we are mixing that particular rock phosphate mineral, and here we are going uh, microbial inoculums. This is uh, microbial inoculums. Uh, we have a type with the bias and they have uh, generated this uh, microbial inoculum. So, which uh, increase the phosphate uh, capacity, phosphate intake capacity of a plant. So, here PROM is in active since 2012. So, this is nothing but our uh, phosphate rich uh, organic manure that is PROM. This is processing of manure into PROM means here you will see uh, the slurry separator is there. 
whatever the digested slurry you will get from that we are going to separate this solid part and the liquid part that solid part is then going for the mixing and blending machine here we are going to add the drop phosphate solid content and our bioculture we are going to add here from that after that uh, we are sending this uh, to granulator granulator we will get, see uh, here are the granular granular prom are there and uh, by packing actual prom bag uh, production at our unit like this one we are just pack it in this bag and uh, sell this one so whatever the liquid part we will get from the Sorry. What are the liquid uh, part we will get from solid liquid separator that is digested slurry that you can use directly uh, in farms uh, by using this tanker or you can pass this through the micro filters and uh, uh, the, which will uh, drippable slurry you will get here. So that also we are going to send in 5 liter or tank or uh, 35 liter tank also. So this one is the uh, thank you for uh, for our panel for this one. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Welcome. Back. A very good okay. presentation from your side. Yes. And uh, it will definitely be a valuable insight for our participants. Thank you yes, for the, uh, this informative session, and uh, I will ask you some questions when we have uh, when we finish this completely. Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, Mr. Sir, can you hear us? Yes. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, sir. I'm fine. I'm fine, sir. So, to all the participants, now I would like to welcome Colonel Rohit Dev. He is a young dynamic leader who moved from the armed forces after an illustrious, uh, illustrious career in November 2018 and joined Punjab Renewable Energy System Private Limited, that is PRESPL, as the COO in December 2018. In his military career of 24 years, he has been at the top of his profession, held all prestigious appointments, and had a detailed insight in the operational logistics and supply chain management of our strategic field organization in the Northern Command. A defense expert, Colonel Rohit Dev, is a graduate from the National Defense Academy. He also holds a master in uh, operational art and strategic thinking. He has done certificate courses from IIM Indoor, NIFM, Faridabad, IIM3, New Delhi, The Art of Living, Bangalore, uh, and courses on environment, health, and safety saturation compliance, CII. He was awarded the nationwide award under, under 50 business and corporate leaders, 2021. Now, I would like to hand over it to you, sir. Please continue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, firstly, my apologies uh, for, you know, not being uh, here on time. Uh, the reason being that I was going to my office and uh, in Delhi and, and they have closed that building today because of uh, the beating retreat ceremony for security reasons. And my laptop is also stuck there as well. So, so I don't have a laptop today, so I'm on the phone. So my apologies there. I had prepared a very good presentation to give you a landscape for the global RE in the biomass sector and beyond. But I will now give a you know oral uh, kind of a presentation. So let me begin by saying that uh, I, I come from a field today uh, where we have bioenergy as the main focus. And when I say that, uh, bioenergy not only involves biofuels, uh, sustainability in fuels, it also involves small, small applications of biomass, which is industrial usage, uh, usage in your uh, maybe industrial boilers, uh, big thermal plants, uh, they could also be used as a solar biomass hybrid projects for IPP. They could be particle board making, furniture making, cloth making, shoe making, cutlery crockery making. So ample, ample usage of the biomass itself. So primarily, I'll give you first an introduction of what we do so that we understand from where I'm coming. And then I will talk on some kind of a policy advocacy, what we need to do globally, especially in India, 
to take our future ahead so i am from punjab renewable energy systems private limited this is about a decade old company started with a colleague of mine who is again from the army so we today in the company in the top 7 are six military people uh, veterans to so to say who are you know trying to make a difference in this sphere of bioenergy what we do is basically we use the biomass and in the course of a presentation biomass would mean any feedstock whether soya bean cotton rice husk you take it as groundnut shell you take it as paddy straw cane straw you you, you know corn cob judy flora lentils uh, doc uh, dual cake that is of cashew nut so all these uh, uh, you know uh, uh, feedstocks which are available on a pan india basis is biomass for me in today's call so from this biomass our company goes into two definite streams the first is the steam for burning it as a fuel in lieu of fossil fuel so you are saving a lot of cost to the exchequer in any country you are by consuming this in lieu of fossil fuel you are saving the precious fossil fuel for the future and notwithstanding you are also giving a lot of income to the farmers uh, and the rural development uh, you know surge by by utilizing this waste which is coming from the earth post harvest so we first the first stream is burning so whether it's a incinerator or a boiler or even a tfh uh, this can be used in this particular stream uh, companies can like us do the entire forward integration we do only supply chain management for some clients we also do operation maintenance and we also invest in the boiler in the capex method and do boot projects for the clients similarly the other stream is the conversion stream if i may call it and in the conversion stream you have biofuels you have compressed biogas 2g ethanol ih2 technology you also have uh, things like uh, you know uh, in which you can convert it to other form factors uh, sustainable aviation fuel so this is the conversion route and in this conversion route prespel in the cvg sector will do the entire landscape of supply chain operation maintenance and boot but in the other bigger ones like ethanol and sf we are primarily going to be the supply chain company in our company whatever we do uh, we stick to the sustainable development goals to the t all 17 if you see our business line uh, you can go on our our website www.prespl.com uh, you can go and see what we do and that is the flavor of our company now coming to the indian landscape in 2012 13 there was a surge in the biomass space with biogas coming in and the, it it was hinging around a lot of subsidies the subsidies in our country were taken away and this industry fell it went to nearly zilch so all the biomass based ipps today are npa all the projects taken up based on biomass are not functioning and that is from where this industry has to rise again sans subsidies on its own two feet with a financially viable model to take this entire bioenergy sector ahead and that is where we are putting the impetus into policy advocacy and we have made many suggestions and 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 writings to the pmo niti aayog concerned ministries and we have been successful over the last 2 3 years and 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 since i have joined i i can talk about that more is that even this bioenergy was not even recognized in the re part in the renewable energy sector in our country we always called everything re if it led to a eventual result of producing electricity so it has taken time to incorporate heating cooling steam uh, as as a process as a utility being re so thermal also is now re the second thing which is affecting this industry which we are working on hard is how to reduce the cost of borrowing because if you are a entrepreneur and if you step up into this sector to do supply chain for a small project or part project you will find a lot of difficulty today because your cost of borrowing is up, upwards of 14% a company like us 10 years in business today from a financial institution called ereda which is under the mnre can get something at 10.45 or or around that much with our influence worldwide today we have got a lending limit from dfc uh, which is at a little lesser per percentage somewhere around 7% but for normal entrepreneurs to rise and that is the way to go in the sector you need the cost of borrowing to come down to 4 to 5% so we are making our strides there to get that done let me give you a little bit of the the global scan as i can give you verbally because you will not appreciate unless i show you show you slides and the graphics there but let me tell you 
by 2050 as per the iea the transition into the renewables is huge our own commitment of being net zero by 2070 as a country is a very bold statement and and i'm quite sure that besides hydel wind and solar which is the mainstay currently we will have to utilize this potential of biomass significantly speaking today if i have to mark numbers nearly 700 million metric tons of biomass sorry of uh, fossil fuel is used in industries and, and and boilers across india whether it's thermal power plants or otherwise the current availability of biomass in india is ranging from 350 in some estimate to about 600 plus in some estimate even if i make a conservative statement to say it's 500 million metric tons availability unfortunately in our country we don't even do 5 million metric tons today. And in that, we have the largest share as a company today in the corporate structure. So you can understand there's a 100 times growth feasibility today. And if exports were opened for biomass-based commodities like pellets, otherwise, there's a huge market also abroad. If you go and see the Argus index as on date, it'll be hinging around 120 $27 to a metric ton for this biomass-based pellet. So the market is there. There is a demand drive. But we unfortunately do not have the most basic component which is structured, which is the supply chain management of this biomass. Anybody can take the offtake. There is demand. The cement industry has gone under such a pressure in the last three, four months. Problem today in the world that the price of coal is only going to rise. And, and, and even if it stabilizes after three, four months, it's not going to come back to the same level in which you were procuring coal at a per GCV of maybe you know less than 2, 1.6, 1.7. Coal has shot up 2.6, 2.2 in the last four months. But the price of the biomass-based product, which can give the relative you know, heat, uh, which is required to generate in any system or a process, is available at a much cheaper cost. Raw biomass you can do today with 1.1, 1, 1, 1.4, 1.5 kind of per GCV. Briquette-based, pellet-based can go as high as up to 1.8 to 2.1 today in the market. There's a huge demand. So if you see the demand, it is there. If you see the growth pattern, it is visibly there. But when you go to the supply chain, you hardly find players today in, in, in the country. And when I say we are the leader in the corporate structure, yes, we are. Because being in the corporate structure, we have two financial you know, investors and two strategic investors. Financials being responsibility, the impact fund of... Uh, Zurich based uh, company just today had a merger with MNG uh, about three or four days back. And the second is uh, NEEP fund, which is the sovereign money of UK through the FCDO and SBI capital in India with SIDBI and others. But the strategic investors are the you know uh, backbone of our confidence, which is Shell and Mitsui. So you imagine an Indian company like us, and if I if, pardon my using the word that we are a grass collection company probably, are invested by Mitsui and Shell of the world but the focus of our own oil giants, the PSUs, was never there to create this ecosystem for supply chain. And today they are running helter and skelter with tenders and tenders failing because nobody has understood the mechanics of the supply chain. Nobody has understood the benefits of the supply chain to the rural community. Nobody has understood the you know, benefit of how it is adding or subtracting the cost of health and environment. So I think today, uh, while the world takes a lot of acknowledgement of what, what I am saying today, and at many global forums where I have been to, a lot of thinkers are, are, are saying that India has huge potential in the biology sector, and it has. We are now collaborating with Brazilian companies and global OMCs to get the 2G ethanol moving in our country. But there are, there's not much push which has come internally from our country, which should have come probably a decade ago. So while I say all this, I think going forward, it is more of a case that the Indian economy which is trying to hinge itself and benefit the rural community has to pick up in the energy sector, biomass, biomass solar hybrid, even a biomass solar hybrid IPP. You know, when we started with the solar, uh, you know, story, we were upwards of 16. We came down to a marginal requirement of 12 rupees per unit. And today we are looking at two rupees per unit nearly or, or thereabout and trying to reduce it. We are tomorrow going into the green hydrogen realm where again, biomass is a key player. And we're looking at econ economy of cost by, by the scales we're going to provide to our country, within our country and exports. So if you see this entire gamut and you see all that I've talked about right now, it all hinges on the supply chain management of the biomass itself from farm to the factory. 
and that is a very key element where we will talk about warehousing and storage there are not enough government shops the state governments are not giving you land for free or at a you know reduced rate for a long term lease to establish your depots collection centers your warehousing your covered storage nothing is coming about so where does the farmer go farmer has got no other uh, you know way especially in the north part of country where the next crop has to be sown within two months of the harvest he has to burn it so these challenges remain we debate these challenges pre uh, delhi and cr going 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 in fumes from probably they are coming from punjab haryana and up but we do a, a very 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 little as a community as a country to address them and i'm happy that the government today is addressing these issues at least for the last 3 4 years quite robustly the satat scheme where the cbg of take of 5000 lois is up for grabs and nearly half of them have been given is a very good story so on average 40000 tons into 5000 is a humongous amount of biomass being picked up from the earth and having added health and environment benefits so if if you if you look around this way the structured supply chain management of of biomass is the need of the hour and everybody can chip in you can curate models you know people talk about the triple p model public public private partnership i have made my own model in which i have added one more p called the people people is nothing but the farmer the logistic element the transporter everybody is involved in the supply chain that's the p the fourth p if you can think of a scenario in which you can pick up the biomass from the farmer at the cheapest rate possible say you you can't afford 3 rupees for a process say you take it at 1 rupee but after the process is complete and you have made your profits and and had a killing there how about plowing back a percentage of the profit back to the rural community the village or the farmer directly so that they feel as a part of being a stakeholder in the entire process this is something i have i have recommended to the prime minister's office and even the niti ayog so i think there there are good times ahead i have personally just been here for last 3 years in the supply chain i have handled supply chain of much more you know diversity by violent service and i understand the challenges very well but i think a tremendous scope in our country with such positive proactive governance today at the state level and central level not all states but few states but certainly at the niti aayog level and the pmo level and the ministers level that they are trying to infuse money i will be very happy in this coming budget if there is something allocated for this re sector of the biomass and especially uh, if the ministry in the coming year comes up with a biomass solar you know kind of a ipp which will finally get the cost up front and and create these systems so i don't know how much time we have but i was told that you know we have q and a as well and we have to finish by 12:30 so i will i will i will try and close myself in the next one minute and then i will be happy to take on questions here and and my focus of today's talk is to only ignite minds to think about what more can be done in the supply chain management of the biomass we are a company i have told you my you know um, company's uh, address we are there on social media you can interact with us you can interact with me directly on linkedin i will be very happy to get ideas because i'm quite sure through this webinar it is going through to many many people and entrepreneurs and budding minds who are thinking about renewable energy so renewable energy let's not restrict ourselves to hydel wind and solar biomass with 500 million metric tons has got tremendous potential to spruce up the economy of this country to put in and feed more mouths in the rural community and engage them proactively and also to create a lot of foreign exchange by export of items and commodity in the future and i would only say that let's join hands and any session from across the globe to help this is most welcome and i will be more than happy individually to take those suggestions forward in a very cogent manner with the concerned ministry and concerned people in decision making today and let's hope for a better and a cleaner india and a cleaner world and that's that will be my parting shot uh, jai hind i will be open to questions hello thanks for sharing your experience with uh, all of us sir. you shared quite with us that's about the sector with us now i will be this what is your answer and just one more thing uh, i will share my presentation with you because in case you are willing to share it with the community which is attending this webinar they'll be actually you know uh, very informed when i share that presentation so if you can just remind me on the email maybe on monday i will share the presentation as well my apologies yes. because my office is locked out i i i can't i couldn't show it today no it is not it's good to have you here thank you
Can you hear me, Mr. Alpo? Alpo, can you hear us? Yeah, hi. Good afternoon. I think you were muted by my. Uh, I was muted by some organizer, uh, so I was not able to okay. unmute. Please carry on. Okay, sir. So, uh, the first question for you is, how about developing carbon footprint? Can you come again? How about developing carbon footprint? Question is not complete. Okay, it's uh, okay. No issue. We'll move to. Other question. How what about developing carbon footprint? Carbon footprint. Yeah. So, uh, is uh, the questioner is asking about what is the carbon footprint from solar energy or renewable energy in comparison to coal? I think. I think is he is asking. Okay. If it is the question, it's, you can just Google it. You will get the answers. But the carbon footprint from renewable energy is zero. some some questions some people ask that the carbon footprint there is a carbon footprint from biomass or biogas but uh, their carbon footprint is traded off because they uh, while uh, they are growing they absorb carbon dioxide and when we burn uh, they release the carbon dioxide so the net is zero and uh, all these technologies which are renewable energy technologies are uh, carbon neutral technologies um and there are huge carbon footprint for thermal power plant it depends upon which technology they are working on uh for per kg of electricity uh, through uh, coal um there are um uh, uh, 0.5 kg of uh, carbon dioxide which has been em uh, emitted uh, through that i will get this number correct but you can just google it out yeah okay so the next for, uh, question is what do you think about government of india's target of becoming carbon neutral by 2070 is it too ambitious project so in my presentation also i have just highlighted on different aspects about that um uh, around this uh, like um, how the things are working in india why renewable energy is not getting promoted in different states what are the major factors which are causing increasing uh, the availability or ins uh, installation of renewable energy in my point of view uh, getting a carbon neutral uh, for a country is not very difficult it's a very simple it, it, it's very easy task but uh, when we talk about get, being carbon neutral so it's about switching off our thermal power plants and getting to renewable energy uh, energy in a large scale to think it is it is a very simple exercise it determines uh, how much uh, we need it but there are lot of implications are there also there are thermal power plants which needs to be closed which has signed the ppa there are business which needs to be honored 
there are people who are working nearby thermal power plants who needs to get jobs there are uh, power plants there are uh, the technology of solar is uh, there but the energy storage is not there till now so there are some technology constraints which which is stopping right now in becoming carbon neutral but i believe if uh, if uh, our policy makers are determined and they are able they are, they want to do this transition and they plan about uh, how the people who are actually working in this thermal sector all uh, related to the mining sector will get uh, converted into some other sector where they will find employment and jobs then this transition will happen and the industry which are actually working in thermal power plant right now are getting transformed into green companies also ntpc is getting tenders of renewable energy there are other uh, thermal power plants reliance tata all are venturing into renewable energy and they are also uh, becoming a giant in the uh, solar field or other fields of renewable energy but uh, for becoming country to be carbon neutral there are few things few more things which needs to be considered and a proper planning has to be done which cannot be done in one day or two day but it the transition will take at least uh, 30 40 years uh, to be complete because uh, the livelihood aspects the social changes the there are places uh, where, where there is only single kind of economy only there is coal economy only there is thermal economy there has to be infused with different kinds of economy different kinds of livelihood options uh, should, should be there so uh, after this so we are doing a study on the just transition how to do the transition people are welcome uh, they can come to our uh, website of iforest iforest.global and they can see our research work on the just transition aspects which is like supporting government in doing this transition for uh, thermal energy to um, green uh, net zero economy thank you okay thank you and uh, there is a, a one more question it is please again explain the impact or he can have on ruler people okay yeah can i take that take that on please yes sir. sure sir okay yeah so there, there are many ways in the ruler degree can impact and, and i will just cover the pointers say for example you are talking about uh, uh, the solar part right so there are many people and especially farmers whose uh, land has been taken and uh, when the land has been taken they get money for it and there are various kinds of deals which they do um, with these uh, farmers and the land landholders which is benefiting them in the long term second is with the still solar kind of a concept Uh, it is feasible now even for small farmers to utilize their land for both cultivation and also giving out their land for that lease part notwithstanding the other parameters but when you come to something like a bioenergy sector and when we are doing biomass scm tremendous benefit to the farmer and if i give you a straw based economy when i'm talking about paddy straw or cane straw on average a farmers in a year and this is an estimate which we calculated at our company level i think 2 years back Uh, was getting in a season in Punjab um, upwards of two thousand five hundred dollars for 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 a small scale farm in terms of the waste he was giving us. It also energizes the community. So what happens is that there are two ways of taking up this biomass. Say I want thousand tons only from say a village. I can take it from one person or I can take it from ten ten people. Right, the choice remains with me. So what we do is we take it from more and more people. so what it does it it spreads the word around of the goodness of this entire ecosystem and in the circular economy the the beginning part is the farmer and even after burning the ash the ash also being green ash can also be you know consumed back as a fertilizer for the farming sector so so so, so i think uh, uh, it's a very good uh, opportunity for people to make money now you look at the entire ecosystem one is for the waste farmer is getting money second is for the transportation or whatever machines he is using to get it to your storage dump he is getting additional money for somebody who is leasing the land to me to make this collection centers is getting money anybody who is involved in the logistic chain thereafter is getting money if i make a bricketing plant or a plating plant i am employing people they are getting jobs if i am if i am doing a cbg project they are getting jobs 
if I'm running a boiler as O&M, then again, I'm hiring people. Yes, few people will be pan-India basis and much, much labor will be localized. So what you're doing is you're sprucing up your rural economy like no other function in the energy sector. The comparison being in the solar world, you have what specific number of technicians to set up a project. And that's it. There are, there are maintenance. But here, this cycle is annual in nature. And once you are hired for a particular project, that bracketing plant or, 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 or other elements of o of a boiler or a CBG project or even the supply chain for a ethanol plant or, or whatever, is going to continue for many, many years. And when the scales and size grows, obviously more people get involved. And and that way, even the financing system, like like, like in our company, uh, the, the farmers get their money in their banks digitally. So good things uh, have been started by, by the current government and they get the money directly in their pockets, right? So it happens as a, as a transaction. Nearly 60%, and I'm and, and not be, you know, on the plus side, I'll be on the minus side. 60% of our revenues, if you press back of my company, are going back into the rural segment. So that's a huge drive happening. So the more we scale up, more impact will come down on the rural structure, the social fabric, the growth of the particular rural belt. And that is what our country needs. And, and that is why we are so driven, you know, even being veterans to enter here. So it's just a transition of a Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan kind, kind of a thing for us. Aim being how to do more. Even in the elements of CSR, uh, we are currently not mandated because of our scale, but I'm quite sure you know, uh, we will be able to do a lot of things. So, so maybe a percent, two percent of CSR of our company after 10 years is a huge amount. And that is the way we will also spruce up the human uh, you know, uh, quality of life uh, with our effort. So that, 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 that's the plus point. If you go into the sector again, say of wind and hydro, even there the, the people who are in the rural belt have gained. For example, if you go to Jaisalmer area where you see a lot of windmills and all, uh, you will find that these, these people have uh, gained primarily because of the land they, they held. Right. Similarly for Heidel, while they are on natural resources, maybe some substation along the, along the path somewhere else will encroach upon somebody's land, somebody will pay it for land. And and obviously, if they are uh, public sector entities, uh, there will be some jobs in that sector. And if they are private sector entities, there will be some jobs coming up there. But when you see the whole holistic bouquet of where the maximum impact is coming, where the maximum involvement of the rural segment itself is coming, it is the bio biomass based bio sector in any country and, and that is the philip which I, I wanted to talk about and i think uh, they, there are tremendous scope of gain both monetarily improvement of quality of life and the social apparatus because once you are going to the rural belt not only are you carrying uh, the money there slowly and gradually the 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 quality of life changes and slowly and much more gradually the social of that place also imbibes new cultures and new ethos and new ethics and and, and things get refined so there's more awareness around so I think uh, it's it's a positive uh, kind of an impact, and uh, we are happy to be participative in that. Thank you. Yes, sir. If I like to just add one thing, please. Uh, please. Sir has rightly says uh, the direct impacts from the Ari things, which are skill development. People will get jobs and all, and there are a lot of livelihood options they can create uh, and uh, they can earn through their resources. But there are a lot of indirect benefits also uh, from renewable energy for uh, some places like which does not have adequate electricity or um, available electricity for 24 hours and there are small, uh, no livelihood options are going on. So in my visits in Jharkhand, I found that there are people who are operating Atta mills, Dal mills, all based upon the RE uh, plants only. And 24 yes. hours they are getting through this RE plants and they are trying to uh, earn livelihood through this. So there are direct employment through uh, renewable energy, their indirect uh, benefit through indirect uh, renewable energy. So I want to say the whole economy can come, uh, can work around renewable en energy. And you know uh, what happens if you see as India's economy uh, as a whole, uh, uh, the large companies may be giving a lot of uh, finance, uh, finance in the total turnover of our country, but these are the small companies, small scale industries, which has people from around 10 to uh, 500 people working. They are the major uh, players in the workforce of the economy. So renewable energy does plays uh, a very big part in giving uh, these kind of industries livelihood option, a reliable power supply on which they can flourish on. Because if they are only dependent upon the grid or uh, electricity, 
which is not reliable then they will not able to produce or uh, increase their production as per they are dependent upon uh, the grid then uh, in renewable energy they can become independent they can plan their self they can avail the local resources available yes yeah. that was very very nicely put actually and in fact uh, when you see the other impacts you see uh, the kind of uh, lung and respiratory diseases in the in the rural community not only cooking and otherwise this has got a huge flip to the health part the environment part as well which is also a you know intangible right now uh, in the 2018 world bank report 5 billion uh, you know the us dollars is our is our bill out of which they, i think at attribute nearly about 40% for 50% to lung uh, diseases happening in the country and they all are born out of these practices of uh, either uh, domestic cooking or or burning of stubble and things like that so so i think uh, there are many intangibles and and very rightly brought out by the by the speaker right now when he's when he's talked about how the other end users are also getting manifested by use of renewable energy and saving a lot of cost indirectly uh, to to the rural belt hello yes sir can you man please carry on okay uh so rohit sir we uh, have here a very good question for you can i ask you uh, please please do ask okay the question is considering the increased by of low cost renewable energy in the power basket what would be the average electricity tariff industry would experience in 2022 to 2025 right so we are we are aware of the tariffs uh, which are currently ranging from anything upwards of 6 to 8 and a little bit there and uh, if i have to stick my neck out based on solar biomass ipp i think if if the first tender of 500 or 1000 megawatts taken out by the ministry say this year and if it goes through the process retending whatever i'm quite sure the global technology available the finance available at the cost of borrowing which i am anticipating and also the supply chain capabilities uh, which we have foreseen in terms of the biomass assessment studies which we have done uh, we can get it in downwards of 6 maybe about 5 5 1/2 rupees per per unit through a biomass solar ipp and that is what we are pitching for and if it comes through it is fine but if you are looking at other means yes obviously when when you have green hydrogen stepping up and it will take us a few years to manifest because of the scale of technology if you take uh, even solar to grow to that degree uh, it will take time but hypothetically say i i give it all a a, a a a pass and we talk about nuclear for example so obviously when you talk about nuclear the cost running for 30 30 years is much more marginalized in terms of the expenditure per unit so there are various you know baskets and bouquets of power which can be generated which are available today those choices have to be made for the right fit and 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 then when 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 the, when the prime minister says you know one 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 india one grid one in one one grid one world those statements i think it has to be an amalgamation you can't go to, tomorrow if we decide that okay only nuclear is enough for our country like many like many developed countries do part of their you know energy needs you may do it but then what do you do with the the, the balance of the economy to develop right so there has to be a great mix, mix of uh, the intent and the implementation and that is where i feel uh, you can go all nuclear for for all i you know can envision but we will never go all nuclear because all these other bouquets uh, all the flowers in the bouquet are supposed to be you know grown and they are they are having deeper impact uh, otherwise on our economy if the basis is to remove poverty and enhance quality of life anything which revolves around the rural sector will grow in this country and the country will be able to pay the price and 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 and, and as you know we are consumers right we are also consumers of the same same energy we we the we pay the price in various uh, you know bad bandwidths across our country every state has got a different norm and a different tariff so those ranges are there but if you want me to peg a price for 2020 2025 i think the price can range from you know as less as 2 rupees to about 8 rupees but what i am pending is at the median which is about 5 and 1/2 rupees should be the average cost which comes from a solar biomass ipp and everything else should align accordingly and any subsidy to be given by the government uh, to 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 uh, or a, or a, 
uh, VGF uh, kind of a funding to be done uh, should be planned by the government to spruce up the sector. So that's from my side. And uh, people can have their own views because somebody from solar will tell you that we can create a grid with only two, two rupees or less. Somebody from nuclear power can say we can start with a capex investment of many trillion dollars, but we'll finally end up in 30 years by having per unit only average around about less than one rupee. So it can all happen. So we are not looking at only the money part here. I'm, I'm also looking at the dimension of uh, growing our country as a, a as a larger economy and not restricting ourselves to one choices. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, now I, I would uh, like to ask question from Urja Biosystem. Can you hear us, ma'am? Yes, sir. Okay. So the question is, can you tell us about SATAT scheme? How can you assist us in setting up a biogas plant? We have applied for the LOI. Okay. Uh, here, Satish Bharat sir is there. Okay, he will give the answer regarding this Satat scheme. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Jain friends, <coughs> basically, you want to know about this Satat scheme, isn't it? Hello. 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 Okay. 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 Can, I, can I just put a sentence to the uh, organizer, please? I, I have to me meet a minister right now. Can I just peel off right now, please? Okay, yeah, sir. No okay, no issue. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hello? Am I audible? Hello? Yes, sir. You are audible. So, you want to uh, know about this Satat scheme? Basically, this scheme was defined in 2018 by Mr. Dharmendra Pradhan, Petroleum Ministry. This scheme is called as Satat, Sustainable Alternative Towards Affordable Transportation. Okay. Uh, with the help of this scheme, government wants to implement 5,000 projects across India to generate CBG, compressed biogas, and to reduce our uh, fuel import. Okay. And they were uh, they were ready to provide any kind of support for uh, setting up those plants. Okay. Basically, in these plants, what we are expecting, setting up a plant, uh, say biogas plant, and then converting this biogas to CBG, compressed biogas. So, I think you are willing to uh, go for this uh, project, isn't it? So, in that case, you want to fill first the LOI letter of intent uh, made by the oil marketing companies. Different oil marketing companies are there. So ONGC is there. <coughs> Your Indian oil is there. HP is there. BP is there. So you want to fill first this LOI. Once you get sanction for this LOI, then you can uh, go for setting up the plant. Okay. In this scheme, government will help you to take uh, your CBG. They are ready to take uh, almost 2 tons, 2000 kg CBG per day. So they will help. They will support. Uh, whatever CBG that you have produced, say two ton or more than two ton, they will be buying this and they will be selling through their pumps. So this Satas scheme is basically support from government to CBG producers. Hello? Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, sir. And uh, now, as timing running. So we are thankful to all the speakers at the this webinar. We are grateful for the time and efforts you all took to share your thoughts and experience with our audience. Since we are entering the new growth phase of the renewable energy sector in India, your comments were very timely. I believe our audience can benefit from your experience. Your enthusiasm is contagious, and we hope that our users will use your suggestions in their RE journey. Thank you again for the contribution. And now we would like to invite uh, you all to create an account of Renewable Energy Mart and grow your business. We have posted the link in the chat box. We will be sharing the recording of the session with all the participants shortly via email. Please give us your feedback so that we can improve our activities. Thanks for all the participants for their time. Stay safe and stay healthy, all of you. We will meet you in our next webinar in the coming day. Thank you all. Thank you. Good day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Himan and Ali.